Since I've already been working in the shop today, I've got dirty hands. See? Dirty hands. Dirty hands. Sometimes my hair hasn't been combed. It looks like and my hands are dirty. But um, anyway, my wife grabs at me more about uh, hair being not combed than she does about dirty hands. <laughs> Her dad was a barber, you know, um, when she used to that. Okay, here's where we are. Let's start right here. Uh, ethanol. Ethanol can be produced from what products? Oh, it can be produced from corn. I'm running around sugar cane or switchgrass. Switchgrass, corn, sugar cane, any of the above. Any of the above. I'm going to sit down in my chair and re-angle my camera here. <laughs> you notice I put my droid phone in a plastic bag today so it won't give me trouble. Like on a sweaty day, my phone starts taking input. It's not there. just going crazy stuff all over the screen. But if I put it in this plastic bag, I never have that problem. I just have to do that out in the field to keep cigarettes from getting soaked in sweat. I can understand why that would be a problem if you're a cigaretter. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. How can you, have we ever taken any gas? That, have you ever taken any gas? Did I, did, have I showed you guys how to check the uh, alcohol content of gasoline? With the rain gauge? Yeah, I talked about it. Well, you can use a rain gauge if you mark it with 10 even. Uh, hey, girl, come on in here. If you mark it with 10 even graduations, you can do it. Um, did you tell me to get you an air filter, Archie? Yes, sir. Okay. Here, catch it. You didn't expect that, did you? No. Uh, All right. <laughs> Keeps things exciting in the back. Uh, Johnson. Okay. All right. Put that put your on my desk, please. Thank you. Don't okay, now right here we've got uh, what we do. Who can who can go through that with me? How do you do it? How do we check to see how much alcohol is in the fuel? You take the rain gauge. It's got the ten equal markings on it, and you you uh, put about nine tenths of it the way with uh, gas, and then one tenth of the way with water, and you put a stopper on it, and you shake it, and uh, you uh, measure out pretty much the bilayer fluid. You got to let it sit for a while, and the alcohol that's in there will go to the water. It likes the water better than it does the gas. And what will happen is, however much you gain in water is what the percentage is that you have. And you've got your mark, so you'll know what the percentage is. And they're supposed to say that over 10% is going to, and it will, you know, it's not good for yeah, alcohol, is really a, in larger quantities, it's good for the fuel system, it sort of messes things up. But on the other hand, it won't run worth a toot either. Remember, I told you I had this. Uh, I had this silly little uh, engine, weed eater engine or something I was fooling around with one time way years and years and years ago down in Texas in the late 70s. And I didn't have any gas on hand, but I had some D Delco D-Clean, which is nothing but denatured alcohol colored purple. And I was, to run, was trying to run that thing on alcohol because I need alcohol to burn. But it was running really lean and, well, you know, wasn't worth it too. And so uh, what they have to do, if, you're, if your car is set up and we're on the next question deals with E85, what you're going to have, what the car does, if it's an E85 car, it actually can measure the amount of alcohol that's in the fuel and change the fueling strategy and the timing uh, to change. I mean, to, for the combustion properties of the alcohol aren't as good as they are of gasoline. Got it? You understand what I'm saying? Now, the reason I said that is this: sometimes people will stop at the E85 pump because it's cheaper, and they'll squirt a bunch of that stuff in their non-E85 car. <laughs> And then they won't tell you that when they bring it in for service. My car runs terrible, and I don't know what's wrong with it. Well, they, they maybe they were goofy. You know, like one guy told you to put diesel in there. You know, we had a guy last semester that yeah. had this diesel he put in his car. Remember that? Sounds like my brother's friend put diesel with his Mustang. Yeah, you put diesel in there, and, uh, and, it, and it, it, that thing was just, he said, I went out, I went out. He had a, I don't know how much diesel he put in it, but he only had a quarter of a tank. And well, we got to, you know, put the gas out of there. I don't have a clue, but it had a, it may have been coming out of the pump that way, but it, it didn't really mess anything up. We put him a fuel pump in there, and he looked at the gas tank, and got put fresh gas in it. And we had to pull the plugs out and get all the sooty, I mean, the, the greasy mess off of them. But the fact is, the alcohol, I was talking to Randy Wilson at the Cadillac dealership in Dothan, and he says they have to, every time they get a Cadillac in there or any, or any GM car that they're working on over there, it's not running the way it's supposed to. The first thing they do is check, get a fuel sample, and check to see how much alcohol is in it. 
And he said, you'll be surprised how these cars will come in here running really crappy, and they'll find 66% alcohol. In the <laughs> but see, you don't want to be wasting your diagnostic time spending all this time trying to figure out why one's running bad by looking at sensors and grounds and voltages and air filter and mass airflow and all that hogwash. That's fine, but the fuel quality should be the first thing that you're concerned about. Because what it, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you got crappy fuel, you're going to have a crappy running car. Now, Dr. Meadows come in here on his pickup one day, back whenever he was president of college, we had a 91 Dodge Ram, and he says, when I turn a corner, it cuts out on me. But then I went along, I'm driving straight, I don't usually have any trouble. And so I got a fuel, I got a fuel sample and it had, it had water in it. So I poured about a quart of uh, alcohol in there. No alcohol picks that water up and lets it go on through. So that took care of his trouble. We didn't have to drain the tank and all that. I mean, uh, we just, it was a quick fix, you know. But the point, here's the deal. E85 means the fuel is made from what? 85% Eighty-five, fifteen. That's right. Eighty-five ethanol. Now, oh, what I backed up and started to say was, you might be surprised. You know how on the pumps it says contains up to ten percent ethanol. Mm -hmm. If you take some of that gas, now that you know how to check it and find, you'd be surprised how many times you'll check that gas and it won't have any alcohol in it at all. It doesn't mean that it always does. It means it can have up to that much. They're just notifying you, but you a lot of times it ain't got no ethanol. So you don't have any way of knowing that unless you know how to chemically test it. You understand my point? All right. Now that's just something I wanted to say. Uh, a flex fuel vehicle can be identified by what? All of them. That's going to be a, all of the above. Emblems on the side, front, and rear. What does it look like? It says a flex leaf. fuel. Yeah, on the Ford it looks like a leaf, and sometimes it will say flex fuel. Uh, now, now, Chrysler and Ford and GM went pretty heavy into that. And I think that the uh, Asian automakers are getting into it. Nissan's doing it a little bit because I've seen on Nissan some flex fuel. But for a while, the, the Asians weren't even into that. They didn't do a lot of that. Okay, uh, methanol is also called, that actually three was a D. Methanol is also called what? I don't know. Oh, please. A methyl alcohol? Mm -hmm. That's what I thought it was. All of the above. Wood alcohol, methyl hydrate, methyl alcohol, all of the above. Okay, which alcohol is toxic? Both. Let me number five is going to be what? Both. Methanol. Well, methanol is your water, your, uh, the stuff you, you buy in the parts house to put in the windshield water. Yeah, well, uh, the, that's the one that, you know, it's, it's, it's intrinsically toxic. Now, to me, I mean, you really shouldn't be drinking any alcohol anyway. Every time I've ever drank anything that had alcohol in it, you know, like somebody hands me a drink at a party and it happens to have bourbon in it or something, I always feel like I'm drinking paint thinner. It doesn't feel like it belongs in my mouth. I've never liked alcohol. I never liked beer because it tastes like, well, I'm not going to say what it tastes like, but it's awful. <laughs> even when I was a teenager, even when everybody, even when I was a teenager, all my other buddies drank and everybody thought I did, but I didn't because I didn't like it. I drank Dr. Pepper while they were drinking their other stuff. And I was a designated driver. Don't tell how many lives I saved, you know. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, you know. But ethanol, they actually take uh, isopropyl alcohol and they, they add stuff to it to make it poisonous so you can't drink it without it killing you. That's the, if you look at it, it's that they add stuff to it to make it yeah, poisonous. Because, I mean, how odd. What is it? Everclear. I thought Everclear is ethanol. Yeah. Straight ethanol. Yeah. Okay. yeah. There you go. Is, and, uh, is that a uh, myth about being able to put uh, rubbing alcohol or through uh, bread to filter that out? Is that, is that true? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why you would be concerned with that. If you want to drink, go to the state store and buy you some liquor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in a hurt for alcohol. Yeah, I know. I understand. But I don't know where that came. I mean, I never ever... I guess I don't run in the circles really talk about that. Okay, now then, because I don't know about that. I'm, I'm afraid to say. Uh, it seems feasible, but I don't think I'd go there. You know, uh, Who figured this out? You know, I'm going to do this, and if it doesn't kill me, I can tell everybody about it. Right? Okay, so here we go. Um, what, is the, what is the most widely used alternative fuel? Anybody got any? Well, I mean, anybody besides him got an answer? I think propane. Yep. Bingo. Propane. Number seven. Liquefied petroleum gas, LPG, is also called what? C. C. Propane. Um, 
There's actually some of the cars like Ford make some Crown Victorias that are basically compressed natural gas. They're off, off, off the shoulder of the floor. They're compressed natural gas. And we actually, I, some, I, during one of these special topics things, I got a test in here where we, I pass out a, some stuff on that. You know, so you can see how that works. Uh, in other words, on that Crown Vic. And like propane, when they burn it in the cylinders, it, it's hotter than anything else in there. Well, it's, uh, I don't know about that, but I do know that it doesn't pollute. I mean, when it comes out of the pipe, it's, you can just about breathe it. That's why you'll see these guys with propane tanks, propane and butane tanks on their forklifts where they're operating in a warehouse where it's not ventilated because yeah. the exhaust is not poison. You see? Yeah. Although I did tell you that little story about that guy that bought that Ford pickup because he'd been killing chickens with his 78 Ford pickup. He'd back them into the big chicken house, and when he had a big mortality rate, he'd get an insurance payoff. So he'd kill a bunch of chickens with his pickup. He just let it run, I mean, and the chickens would kill like 10,000 chickens would die. And so he buys this 2003 F-150, and he comes back and he goes, I don't like this new truck because it won't kill my chickens. <laughs> so he backs it in and it runs for hours and hours and hours, and no chickens are dead. They're just running around like they're happy as a lark. So they may have a little headache in their head or something, but for the most part, all they're getting is carbon dioxide, and that ain't hurting nobody. See what I'm saying? That's, that's this climate change stuff rated on carbon dioxide. Who you heard me talk about that before. Okay, um, now then, what we got here is, uh, let's see, let me back up. How much compressed natural gas does it require to achieve the energy of one gallon of gasoline? 122 cubic feet. 122 cubic feet. When refilling a compressed natural gas vehicle, why is it recommended that the tank be filled to a high pressure? The range of the vehicle has increased. Duh! That's not a hard question, is it? Okay. Technician A says that the stoichiometric ratio for gasoline is about 9 to 1. Is that right? Brandon knows better than that, don't you, Brandon? What is it? 14.7. More or less, yeah. Real close to, I mean, 14.7 is, uh, is the laboratory. If you look at your Chryslers, they'll actually edge that above and below that as, for, as the emission system optimizes it, but... Uh, at least that's what we were told at, at Chrysler School. What does that mean? 14.7 to 1 by weight. A car burns 9,000 gallons of air for every gallon of gasoline. All but right. that's by volume. Now, by weight, you're basically looking at 14.7 pounds of air for each one pound of fuel. So that's why I say 14.7 is the optimum air fuel ratio, right? It is, because you're actually, uh, if you draw a graph, and you can see a graph on the front of the uh, exhaust gas analyzer, if you go richer than 14.7 to 1, your hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide go up. Because every molecule of oxygen wants to get married, you know, to, well, like you got, what did you got? You got carbon dioxide, right? You got, so you got two molecules of oxygen to one molecule of carbon, right? That's, that's, as, that's as good as you're going to get. And that's where you got, what you get at 14.7 to 1. Now, if you've got, a richer mixture with like 12 to 1 or something like that, there's not enough oxygen for every carbon molecule to get married to two. So some of them will just be married to one. Some of them will be married to none. So you got hydrocarbons, which is no oxygen with a molecule, and it's usually sooty. And then you got carbon monoxide, which actually you can't smell or see, but you shall die quickly if you start breathing this stuff. Yeah, you start getting light here, you know. Yeah, that's right. Uh, of course, you know, if you're just breathing gasoline, you can't see that, but you can smell it. But you can't smell carbon dioxide. You know, you peel over, and next thing you know, you're a dead man. But you know? usually it's referred to as like 15 to 1, just generic term. And I think the ASC test, when it has some drivability questions, will give options, and it's the same 15 to 1. Yeah, so yeah. they round it. Yeah, yeah. they round it. Yeah. But for eons, we've heard 14.7 to 1. That's all I've ever heard. Yeah, 14.7, yeah. Well, like I say, what I was telling you, Chrysler moves it up and down. You know what I'm saying? Chrysler will say sometimes it'll be 14.9, sometimes it's 15, sometimes it'll be 14.5. 14. Yeah, Based on prevailing conditions, it may be slightly different, barometric pressure even, and stuff like that. Right. But we all weigh around everything at 14.7 because that's the Anyway, the long and the short of it is you go leaner than that, a leaner exhaust is hotter and you're going to get oxides of nitrogen. Now we got 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and whenever you get over 2,500 degrees in a combustion chamber, you're going to start locking those together. Getting all these oxygen, oxides of nitrogen compounds, and that ain't good. 
The catalytic converter takes care of this for us, but there's only so much it can do. So what we try to do is we try to set the fuel system up so it will burn just as clean as it possibly can before it ever sees the catalytic converter. And the catalytic converter also does not like having a bunch of raw gas going through it because it's already running at like, you know, 1,700 degrees this sometime. Mm -hmm. And it can melt that sucker down and cause all kinds of issues. That's why I don't got one. I'm running way too big. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you're doing that. You're actually uh, doing off-road racing drift stuff, too. Huh? <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Mach 2 with his hair on fire. Okay. Okay. All right. Now then, uh, where are we going? Where are we going? Uh, nine to one. Okay, I'm sorry. We're on ten. Technician A says the stoichiometric ratio for gasoline is nine to one. He's a yo-yo. He don't know what he's talking about. Technician B says the stoichiometric ratio for ethanol is about nine to one. Uh, which technician is correct about that? And B is correct on that one. Nine to one is good for ethanol. You see the difference? You need 14 to one. Yeah. You need more fuel for ethanol to get the job done. That's why you're not going to get as good a gas mileage. Well, why do they, they do that then? Well, they're actually concerned about emissions. They're concerned about taking us off of foreign oil dependency, which if they just drill over for the oil we've already got here, we, they could do that, you know. But, I mean, the environmentalist people are after that. I'll tell you the problem that I got with making it out of corn uh, is uh, if you fill up a big SUV like a, you know, expedition or a navigator like this one out here, mm -hmm. um, the amount of corn it takes to make enough uh, alcohol to fill this thing up could feed somebody for a year. God. That's how much corn you use to make that alcohol. Um, now, what you do is, uh, if you just mix it in smaller quantities, you know, it doesn't take as much. But at the same time, what did we say on our first question? Switchgrass, sugar cane, you know, corn's only one of the things you can make. You can make it out of garbage. You can take rotting paper and you make, make, ethanol? It, make ethanol, make alcohol. Yeah, that's it. What is wood alcohol? What, is that what alcohol is made out of wood? And you rock the wood and you ferment it and it makes alcohol. Anything and you living distill it. Anything that wants living can be made to make alcohol. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, first you got to make your beer and then you got to distill it. You know what I mean? you got to make beer to start with and when you distill it, the alcohol is what comes out. Get that right. All right. Sure. Uh, of the alternative fuels listed in the text, which is the highest octane? Ethanol. Um, that would be the one with the highest... Uh, Hydrogen to carbon ratio. What about compressed natural gas? Yeah, um, you know how these. What you know what it says? The R plus M squared. You know what that means? Uh -huh. You see it on the pump. I R, you know R plus M squared method. And you'll see it. It'll say. Uh, oh, that's how they check the octane. Yeah, it'll say R plus M and O, and then by two. Divide by two. What is Research motor, and you get the difference. What you do there, see, research method gives them a number. Motor method gives them a number. These are the two ways that they check it. And then the last one, I mean, whenever they divide there, they want the, the average between those two numbers. That's what gives you your octane. Now, higher octane fuel burns slower. You do that, right? That's why if you put high octane fuel in a vehicle, it's not made for high octane fuel. Sometimes it runs like crap when it's cold. You ever seen that? Put high octane fuel in there. Mark Shipes in there working on his Bronco. It's kind of like our big Bronco. And it's popping and snorting and cutting up and popping and snorting and cutting up. And you're, in other words, he cranks it up cold and it cranks up. But when he gives it gas, it goes boop, boop. It's popping out the intake and it won't hardly run. And he's already cleaned the injectors. He's working on it. He's replaced the, this, that, and the other. And he's busting his fanny. And he's beating his head against the wall. And I guess he wasn't doing too good of a job because, you know, I helped train him. But anyway, I said, Mark. I said, why don't you go out there and ask the customer what kind of gas are you burning? Don't ask any leading questions. Just say, what kind of gas are you burning? And I guarantee you they're going to tell you they're burning premium gas because that's what's wrong with that thing. It's got premium gas in it. It's supposed to have 87 octane, which burns faster and is more suitable. So he says, okay. So he goes out there and he says, what kind of gas are you putting in this thing? Oh, man, we're putting 93 octane premium. Best we can get. Okay, well, let them warm it up. Drive it until that's gone. Put some 87 in there and you don't need to work on it anymore. Charge them the diagnostic fee and send them on their way. Well, they worked on it a half a day already. You know what I mean? But see, the thing about it is, you got uh, that's what I was getting at. The fuel quality, you got no way to test to see if they're using premium. They actually, you do. There's a way you can, uh, we need to put a little coffee cup with a cover on it and a thermometer in it. And you put this water in. Well, actually, you got hot water and you got a little chamber. You put some gas in and you put a, uh, you, so you can measure the pressure of this. Uh, you got to have 160 degree water, 160, 100, 
and put this little chamber full of gasoline in there, and you're going to see how, the, how much the pressure goes up over a good amount of time. And that's basically a reed vapor pressure tester. Right. So if you know, you can tell if you've got premium or you know, like as a fuel testing thing that we used to do with Ford. But um, I say that. I mean, they told they taught us how to do it and all that kind of thing, but we almost never did. <laughs> but if, he, if he'd have done it that day, he wouldn't have been fighting with that Bronco. Okay, let's move on. I'm, I'm getting, taking too much time in here, and uh, we're already uh, 20 minutes into our uh, class session here. Okay, uh, vehicle burning compressed natural gas loses how much power as compared to gasoline? Mm -hmm. That's 12. That's question number 12. Got any 40. idea? 10%. Got that? So that's not bad, really. Not really. Uh, you're gonna lose 10%. In other words, if you got if you got 100 horsepower, you're gonna lose that. You're only gonna have 90 if you're using CNG, right? Okay. The stoichiometric the stoichiometric ration. That's that question's fouled up. Ratio. You know how that happened? How they managed to put the stoichiometric ration instead of the stoichiometric ratio? The spell check didn't catch ration. <laughs> it's a word. That's how that was spell check. Okay. Stoichiometric ratio for CNG. Is what? This is important numbers. This will be on a pop test with it. I will not be giving you the answers to, so get ready. No, what is it? Remember that? Memorize these now. Uh, 13. What did you say it was? Are you making a guess or what? It has more octane, right? Yeah. 16.5 to 1. That's what it is, right? Because it has more octane. Yeah, and that's by weight, right? Yeah. Whenever we measure the, the uh, fuel injector fuel delivery, fuel delivery, the only electronic fuel injectors that we got with our fuel delivery, do I have one in here? How are they measured? I mean, uh, how do they measure? Pounds or... Pounds, or yeah. Pounds yeah. per hour. If you're Japanese, CCs. Yeah. Like on the like on the old Fords, uh, the gray fuel injectors, like the Crown Vickies had on them, was 14 pound per hour injectors. The orange ones, like the Mustangs had on them, was 19 pound per hour injectors. When you're loading fuel in an aircraft, and I mentioned this to him yesterday, you measure it by the pound, you don't measure it by the gallon. You know why? Because yeah. ain't nobody paying for it by the gallon. They're paying for it by the pound? Yeah. No, well, yeah, well they actually got it. We're, we're aircraft, you, your weight's everything. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know how much fuel it takes to fill up the tanks on a MiG-25 Fox bat? 14 tons of jet fuel. And that's something? It's actually alcohol. That's, that's a lot And the Russian money. pilots used to drink a lot of that alcohol because they didn't make it poisonous. They, they get drunk because they didn't have enough to do. And that's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, let me see, let me back up here. When an engine designed to burn compressed natural gas may include what design modifications? That's a scratch, isn't it? Increased compression ratio. They're going to do that because it's going to give you a little more power, right? In other words, you're increasing the power by increasing the compression so ratio. Yeah, so you don't lose yeah. that 10%. Now, what is the problem with the compression ratio being high on a regular motor? They reduced the compression ratio when they took the lead out of the gasoline. Did you know that? Yeah, they did. You see, they dished the pistons and stuff. What's your problem with that? If you're going to build an engine, you want to, if you want to build an engine and you want it to last a really long time without having to re re be rebuilt because of the worn-out ring, you put, you know, you, you make the the compression. It's okay to have the compression fairly high, but you don't want a lot of drag on the cylinder walls. You got little thin, skinny rings that are really low tension and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the, the compression ratio is going to going to improve your power, but it's going to reduce the life of the engine typically. You know, it's just and there's other reasons for that too. I'm not an engineer, but I will tell you that the people that I knew that were engineering engines when I was working down in Texas, if they were going to build an engine that would last a long time, like put it on an airboat or something, they'd always build it lower compression, so it would last it would last longer. You know. Okay, um, a flex view vehicle. Excuse me, a flex view fuel vehicle has enhanced fuel system components that include all of these except what? Okay, uh, A, corrosion resistant injectors, D. B, stainless steel fuel rail, C, corrosion resistant fuel pump, D, low temperature resistant O rings. I'd say it's either A. That's, or all. C. that's, D. that's actually D. Every one of those, and one of the reasons that and some of our textbooks will say it's a good idea to buy a flex fuel vehicle, even if you don't intend to use the flexible fuel stuff in it, because the fuel system is more robust. It's got a better fuel pump, better fuel injectors, better everything. Because it has to have, because that alcohol is so corrosive and all that. You see? Um, all right, let me see. Uh, a flex fuel vehicle uses the PCM to make adjustments to the engine according to the percentage of ethanol in the fuel. The PCM must adjust which engine settings. This is number 16. Okay. Right? Uh, it's going to do A and B, ignition timing and quantity of fuel delivered. 
All right, let me ask you this. What if I was going to take a car that was set up to run at sea level, and I was going to take it to a really high altitude, and I was going to run it? What do I need to do with the timing? Obviously, I need to change the air fuel mixture, right, because the air is thinner up there. Mm-hmm. What do I need to do to the timing? It's harder. It'll advance it. it advance it? Yeah, you got less oxygen. You need more time to burn. Oh, yeah, yeah. How many of you have ever taken a car that was set up to run at sea level and driven it in the mountains? Uh, yeah. Me and my mama one time went to on a trip on this 60, uh, 72 Chevrolet. It had a 350 in it, a little two-door thing, but it had inside outback glass on it. You ever seen them all inside outback glass on them cars? Mm-hmm. You know, drive that thing out there. And uh, we went to the Grand Canyon. And you know what the altitude is at the rim of the Grand Canyon? 8,000 feet above sea level. Did you know that? Uh, I know yeah, that. the rim of the Grand Canyon is 8,000 feet above sea level. Well, when I was out there, when I was out there, when we were out there driving that Chevrolet, it just had an old, you know, quarter jet carburetor on it. That thing ran like a dog. Now, if I had been advanced the time, it would have helped it. You see what I'm saying? But I mean, we were just driving it, and you could just go all the way to the floor. I feel like it's all stopped up, run terrible. <laughs> but now you're uh, the newer cars up to 4,000 feet, or I don't know what the newest ones may have it all the way up. But for a long time, from sea level to 4,000 feet, the computer could change the everything that needed to be changed. If you're above 4,000 feet, there had to be modifications for altitude. And then some of the Jeeps, you had to hook up a ground wire, put a different crank sensor back there, which gave you a little bit more time in advance and all that kind of thing. Okay. I didn't charge anything for that information. Okay, now right here we got a, let me see, 17. Ethanol can also be called, yeah, we're going to call it grain alcohol. Flex fuel vehicle burning at E85 gets how much fuel mileage when compared to a straight gasoline? Less or more? Less. Come on, you know it's going to get less. Uh, it doesn't cost as much, you know. I think, what is it? Anybody looked at the pump? What's ethanol running? I mean, E85 running at 275 a gallon or something? Right near, huh? Right near, huh? Yeah, I've seen yeah. some somewhere. Right. I can't remember. It used to be one off uh, 29, I do believe. Yeah, I've stopped and seen it. I've seen the pump where it said E85, you know. I mean, they not at every gas station, but you'll see them occasionally. And uh, that's why you got to be careful not to you know, cram it in there. Um, the fuel pump in a flex fuel vehicle uses what kind of brushes on the armature, armature commutator? Mm-hmm. You should That's know that. Everybody thing. should know that intrinsically. Graphite. Graphite? Graphite. Because they're real slippery. And they're not corrosive. They're not corros- and graphite is also a conductor, right? Yeah. You know something I thought was funny? When I came here to teach, That's I'm going to plant bugs. So I'm going to tell you as an instructor, it's a heck of a lot harder to plant bugs sometimes than you think it is. You know, we work and work and work and try to make the cars run right, and I came here and I had to get, think a different way. I had to break them so that the students would have to find out what was wrong with them, right? So I would take me a distributor cap off of this one printer car I had with a little S10 Ranger, I mean, S10 uh, Ranger. Chevrolet. Chevrolet. And I took it and I sprayed water. All I put in a distributor cap. Put it back on there. Ha, ha, ha. Boy, they're going to have fun with this. And I went, boom. <laughs> brand like brand new. I said, what's the matter with this? I don't know how many times I feel water in the distributor cap and I can't even make it work, man. Well, this is what you got to do if you're going to do that. You got to get it really, really, really good and hot. And you got to spray some in the bottom of the distributor so when it goes up, it will condense and have little beads. But if you can spray that water in there, and you just run like a sewing machine. Now, if you do it with a steam cleaner, you know, for some strange reason, it does crazy things, but it's got to have condensation up in there. Something else I heard people say all my life that I thought was kind of stupid. When I, they says, all you have to do to make an engine run bad is mark around on the inside of the distributor cap with a pencil and it'll run terrible. That don't work. <laughs> I did all kinds of that trying to get one to misfire and cut up. Didn't do a darn thing. Now it might have you drove it a while. I mean, I scratched around there with that pencil. Boom, boom. You know, great. Here's something else I did. I took all of the spark plugs out of the old mobile. Bent the gap, slammed shut on it. Still right. I just bent them shut. Cranked up. Vroom. <laughs> then I can't even break a car. You know, how am I supposed to be showing piece of mind fix it? Actually, actually, if you bend the gap shut and dip it, and dip, it and dip it in oil, yeah. But I just bent them shut and put them in there dry, and it cranked up and ran pretty doggone decent. <laughs> and I couldn't believe that. I just blew me away, you know. That's just a true story. I'm not making this up. But, um, I don't believe you. Uh, you know, of course, you can put some yo-yo in his backyard. He makes a little bit of a mistake, and it runs horrible. You know, when I'm trying to tear something, I can't get it run bad. Enough. These cars won't run, boy. They... All right, now where are we at? We're gonna um, let's see the fuel the fl- fuel cap on a flex fuel vehicle. Maybe what color? Green. Green. Yeah. yeah that, well, yeah. That, no, 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 no. Eh, 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 yellow. Yellow. Yeah. Yeah. You're thinking about going green. That's what it is. 
actually <laughs> uh, Propane is stored in tanks as a liquid at a pressure of what? C. 300 psi. Compressed natural gas fuel enters the engine intake manifold at a pressure of about what? Mm -hmm. Four and a half to seven inches of water. Now, you remember what I was talking about, inches of mercury versus inches of water? And inches, inches of water is a whole lot smaller than inches of mercury. Here's, a, here's something I want you guys to do. I'll see the smartphones come out in a minute. I want to know how many, inches, how many inches of water, as far as vacuum goes, is equal to one inch of mercury. Mercury's not a lot either. Mercury's a little bit. Water, the, inch, the number of inches is a lot. But, I mean, the exact same pressure is a lot of water inches... You know, so somebody, somebody tell me the answer to that. How many inches of mercury is equal to one inch of water as far as vacuum goes? We're talking about vacuum readings, okay? Uh, you know, the smartphones come out when I usually ask a question like that. Okay, so, and uh, let me see. Don't send any text to your girlfriend while you're doing that. Just look up the question. <laughs> All right, so the last one, the shelf life of oxygenated fuel. Oxygenated fuel is how long? 90 days. 90 days. Oxygenated fuel, that's just yeah. alcohol and stuff. Yeah, well, it's actually got some, you know, compounds in it. Yeah, that's a, that's a research uh, question for you. Find out what oxygenated fuel is. They do to make money. Yeah, this was a class session, and we head out into the shop. We did it in 31.